So I have been thinking about which refactoring technique I find it as the most useful. And I came to the conclusion that it boils down to smaller methods and clear names. So in this video, we will talk about how you can refactor your source code towards smaller methods, what arguments most people use against that practice, but also why you should use it anyway. I have here a small example that we will refactor using small methods with proper and clear names. The example is not that long, but even then, it's not clear at the first glance what this code is doing. I need to pay a lot of attention to understand that in fact, this is part of a customer service that has a method add customer. So I imagine that inside of this add customer is doing typical things like trying to add a customer into a database. But for example, what type of validations is it doing? What type of mapping it can be doing? What else is being done in this method? I need to pay a lot of attention into the source code to understand what it is doing. Besides the fact that if I am not proficient on the language that is being used here, likely that might be a problem to me because it will require an extra effort to understand. It's also important to say that when you need to read so many things and try to understand so many variables that come to play in a method like this, you expand the level of cognitive load required to understand this code because you will need to juggle so many things in your head. So let's refactor this source code using small methods with proper and clear names. And by the end, let's talk about eventual objections that you can have to this transition and with end result. So let's start to refactoring. So the first thing that I see here is a validation of the name. So on this case, it's just doing a simple call to the string is null or a white space. And based on that throws an exception. But even then, I think I can improve this thing. So I will extract a method and I will name it is a valid name. It's not exactly how I want it to be. So I want to provide here exactly the name so let me do that small change. Okay, and now the first small method, it's here. So let's keep going. Now we have another validation regarding the email. But this time I noticed that I'm not only checking if the email is filled or not, I also have here some type of code that is trying to do some kind of email validation. And one thing that you'll notice when you have long methods is that often we'll use comments to add extra context to what is being done there. So what we'll do here is to extract this whole thing as a method. I will call it is valid email, and then we'll change the input and the output of the method as well. So I wanted to get the string of the email itself. Let's apply it. And I want it to return a Boolean. And then I will throw the exceptions if needed outside of this method. This exception goes away. We return false and here as well. And if nothing of that is false, then we return true. That means that if now we get back into our method, we need to now handle the return. So on this case, if not is valid, the request our email, we should throw an exception. And by the way, you should have warned me that I forgot to have not here. We have here another validation that looks like the one from the name. Let's do exactly the same. So, and let's change the method to return the not also to get a string as an input. Okay. So the validation part is done. So let me just do a small cosmetic thing because I like it. I will remove the braces. And now there's one extra step that I can take. For example, since every single thing that I have inside of this block is regarding the request validation, I could extract a method with it. I could even create a class that is the request validator. On this case, I will simply move it to a different method. Done, and this time I don't want to change the input and the output because I'm in fact validating the request. There's no output because if something goes wrong, it will throw an exception. So moving on, now we have here something that says that is mapping a request to a customer domain object. So instead of using comments for this, let's do one simple thing that is create a method that will do the mapping. Once again, extract method, let's name it map. And as you can see, it will return the customer from the add customer request. The code is becoming clear. Now I can read here that it comes from a validate request and then is mapping that request into something that is a customer. I could also name this thing to, for example, map to customer domain, map to customer, something like that. I typically move this type of method to, for example, an extension method in C-sharp. 
but let's keep it this way for the purpose of this video. So on the next line, now we know that this method also does check by the email to see if the customer already exists. It's using some interface of a customer repository, so we can do something with this. So what I'm thinking is that we can do here an if statement. If not, the customer exists, now we provide the email there, and if it doesn't exist, we will throw exactly the exception of the line 32. Now we can generate this method and we'll move part of this logic into there. But this time with the return and instead of is null, let's do a is not null. And the input is a customer email. This means that now we can throw away this else if, we can throw away this comment, we format the code, and now this main function that we have here, it's quite clear. So, okay, I have here a mistake, this shouldn't be a not, because if the customer exists, I want to throw an exception, not the other way around. So, let's look into the, the code that I have here and try to see if it's better than it used to be. On my perspective, if now I land into this add customer for the first time or after a long time, I can clearly see what does it mean to add a customer. First, we do a validation to the request. If I need to know what type of validation, I can drill down into this method. Then I will map it to a customer object. Then I will check if the customer exists using the email. If it exists, it will throw an exception. Otherwise, I will save it. Now I have here six methods that are super supporting that feature. Obviously, after some refactoring to this thing, we would improve the design and move some of those things into a different place. That is not the point that I'm trying to make it. So I'm trying to make you understand that by simply extracting things into smaller methods, good names, we improve the source code. In other words, by making the use of small methods with clear names, now my source code looks like a story, so it's easy to read and understand what it is doing. Even if you don't know much about this language, you can read this thing and have a sense of how do we add a customer in this method. But now I know that there are a few things that you can argue against this approach. One of them is that doing this is an extra effort. You might also argue that extracting a one-liner to a given function that it's only used in a single place uh, seems ridiculous. And I, I get that, but I think that that comes from that idea that many of us have, because we learned that way, that we use methods and functions to the duplicate code. When we want to reuse a piece of functionality, we'll extract a method. However, methods have also the purpose of readability and code organization, in my opinion. Some might argue that there's an extra overhead by using multiple methods, or that it's hard to follow the source code, for example, when you are debugging, because there are so many methods, the class becomes so long, and that it's not easy for that. I get all of that criticism. I know that some of those topics might be fair to, to discuss. However, I think that the other side of the equation makes this thing an obvious choice. And why? First of all, if we think about the rules for simple design, there's one that is expressiveness. So the code should be really clear what it is doing. It's expressive, it's clear the intention. And I it's clear to me that in this approach, it's obvious what he's doing, while in the other one, it was not. The next one is the famous SRP, so single responsibility principle. On this case, each of those functions have one single responsibility and one single reason to change. While in the other case, I have one huge function with so many reasons to change. Another reason is that evolution in this type of scenario, I believe that it's easier in the future. Why? Small things like extracting that validate request to a validation class will be easier. If you need to reuse some of that logic, it's simpler to extract it to a different place. So things become easier to maintain. Regarding the topic of cognitive load, it's also important to say that, okay, I can always drill down in the source code. At a given point, I just need to juggle a few things to understand what he's doing. 
So if I'm reading this method and I'm curious about what does it mean to validate a request, I can drill down and now my world is different. I can focus on what does it mean to validate a request. So I don't need to have so many information in my head to understand what the code is doing. You also notice that by using proper names, I could throw away many of the comments that I have there. And you know all the problems that comments have in source code, so we don't need to discuss them in this video. So just to recap, code becomes so much more straightforward and easier to read that I honestly believe that having all those single small methods really pays off. Just one important note, please remember that there's no limit of lines per each method. Now I would like to hear from you. Do you agree with me? Do you practice the same thing? Make sure you let me know in the comments. And in the meanwhile, YouTube thinks that you should watch this video right here.